Hello and thanks for joining me. Today I'm in my outside broadcast studio because it's an absolutely fabulous Easter weekend. I want to do a very quick ask me anything, get through as many questions as I can because they've been piling up a little bit and I said to people I would get back to you and so far I haven't so apologies for being slow. So let's crack on. The very first question is uh, from Keith Hyder. Um, Keith says, please can you produce something on post-processing techniques? Well Keith, um, by the time you see this you may have seen my previous one where I talk you through my entire workflow, so take a look at that. I don't go into any great detail because that's not what this channel's about, but it gives you an idea of how I approach things, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, next question is from Freddie Ott. Uh, he says, I always wonder how much time do you spend producing one of your <coughs> fantastic vlogs? Well, uh, Freddie, actually, you might be surprised how little time I spend. <laughs> actually, you might not be surprised how little time I spend on them. First of all, I would say that when I go out to shoot out on location, filming adds about an hour to what otherwise I would be doing anyway because I always approach it with kind of like three tiers of importance. The first one is I'm going out for a walk or a hike. When I do that, that's the most important thing. So I always take my camera kit with me. So the second thing is, do I find anything to shoot with my stills camera? Um, so if I do, then I'll take those shots. So walk first, photography second, uh, and then really it's a case of, well, is there anything worth vlogging? And so if there is, if I think that people will enjoy what it is I'm taking pictures of, then I'll film it as well. So it's in those or in that order. And probably the filming adds about an hour to that process anyway. So not really too onerous. Um, I have to say that by and large, when I first started doing this, I probably spent far too much time filming uh, and it was a bit of a pain. Um, and I guess with experience, um, I think this is going to be about my 90th, 89th, 90th, something like that. So I've done quite a few and I have got it buttoned down to a pretty fine art. Also, I've been really careful by trying lots of different equipment and narrowing it down to equipment that's really easy to use. So I'm currently talking to you on a gimbal, uh, a, a DJI Osmo Pocket. And what that Osmo Pocket does, it means I don't have to worry about smooth footage, the horizon's always level and all those sort of things that otherwise would be a pain. With this little camera, I switch it on. Focusing's easy, so I don't have to worry about that. My audio goes straight into it, so pretty straightforward. In terms of my um, post-processing, uh, I would say probably about two or three hours per video. Um, it used to be faster, but I cared less. I do try and make them a little bit more interesting now, uh, although this one might be pretty much a chop out the ums and ahs, uh, and there we are, we're done. But uh, with the big sort of location ones, about two or three hours, um, and that's not really that much of a problem because I, you know, I'll tend to do it over a period of two or three days. So it's just, you know, 20 minutes here, half an hour there. So it's really no problem at all. And it's really enjoyable. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Freddie. Really appreciate it. Okay, so the next question actually is pretty much the same question from three people. So to all three of you, thank you ever so much. And they are Miguel Corona. What a great name, Miguel Corona. Brilliant. Um, Ray Byrne uh, and Dr. Emile One, if ever there was a James Bond villain. Um, so yeah, basically they're all asking me pretty much the same thing. Could I just tell you briefly about the filter system that I use? Absolutely, no problem at all, happy to. First of all, let's talk about using filters anyway. Now there's a debate amongst modern digital photographers. Some fall into the camp of you don't really need filters because of what you can do in post. And others will say, yes, you still need filters because you want to go back to post with as good a starting point as you can. For a long time, I didn't use filters. And I'll be honest, that was more because I was too tight to buy any. And I was offered this little set of filters which I'll talk more about in a moment, by a friend from my camera club, because he was upgrading, and he had these for sale for 40 quid. And I responded really fast and said, I'll take them. Uh, and I whizzed straight down <laughs> and took them off his hands, because um, it was a total bargain. Um, since I've got them, I wouldn't be without them. 
so I can see it from both sides of the argument. What I was doing in the past in order to compensate for not having grad filters, uh, and I did have 10 stops and ND filters, they were screw in types, but I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but before I had something to control lighter and darker areas of the same exposure, I was bracketing um, and I was spot metering and using all sorts of techniques to compensate. And to be honest, wasn't a problem. And it helps to actually try and do that because it forces you to understand exposure. It forces you to understand that when you get back to your computer uh, and you've got a series of exposures that you know you're going to have to bring together to create your final image, um, it, you have to have an understanding of what you're doing to get to that final image. So that was helpful. But when I'm out in the field now, if I've got a really bright sky and I put a graduated filter on to darken the sky down, that just makes life really easy. It cuts out a bit of um, a bit of hassle. I could still get a good image, but it would take me more work to get to it. Now, filters back in the days of film photography, when I started doing landscape photography in the early 80s, were pretty much essential because there were many shots you just simply couldn't get without filters. Other types of photography do allow you to have more control over the lighting, but in the landscape, you get what you're given. And when you get high contrast situations and even simple things like sunsets and sunrises, which we all like to shoot, you'll still find that everything below the horizon is really dark and everything above the horizon is, is really light. So a filter helps. Let me show you about these filters. Now, most filters come in sets and you have a filter holder and the standard dimensions for the sort of photography that, that I do. This is a micro four thirds, but on a crop sensor or full frame. Most, most of the people that I know are using 100 millimeter square filters. These are a bit smaller. They're only 85 millimeters. Uh, it makes no difference to me. They worked perfectly well on my Nikon, which was a crop sensor. And what you have is this little holder. A ring screws into the front of your lens. Um, I've only got one lens, as you may know, if you follow my channel, so that makes life really easy. And this ring, 72 millimeter diameter, actually lives on, on the lens. The lens is in, in the camera bag with a, a soft lens cloth and it faces down because so, I can't put the lens cap on. So it uh, works fine. I'm not in any danger of scratching the glass, but it just means I have less things to mess about with. So this little thing goes on there and this little holder just slips over the ring that's screwed into the front. Now, this filter that I've got in there, as you can see, it rotates. That's my polarizing filter. It lives in there. Sometimes I'll take it out if, because uh, it's going to take about a spot, uh, it's going to take about a stop of light uh, out of my image. And sometimes I want as much light as I can get, so it'll come out. But most of the time it lives in there. Um, and then there's slots in front, about just enough to shoehorn three filters in if I need to. I usually only be using one. And my go-to filter, and you'll hear lots of landscape bloggers talk about these filters. Uh, my go-to filter is what's called a 0.9 soft grad. Uh, and that's where it's dark at one half, light at the other. And the transition from dark to light is soft. Um, and that's a 0.9. Uh, equates to three stops of darkening and you simply slide it in there and you can rotate it slightly if you need to and it darkens down the sky. If you follow my channel you'll notice that in my previous video I actually used two of these. I had another one coming in underneath that way with the only unaffected bit across the middle. So this sort of system gives you quite a bit of flexibility in how you can control the light uh, and that's why I find it really useful. Um, the only other filters that I've got that I make any use of are my 10 stop filter. Uh, that's uh, pretty much like welding glass. And that uh, allows me in bright sunlight, I'd probably get about 20 to 30 seconds uh, shutter speed. Um, in lower light, anything up to five minutes. So that's where you can get creative with, with what you do with your scene. Some landscape photographers almost always have a 10 stop on the front if there's any water or moving clouds. Um, I'm slightly more judicious than that, but I do enjoy a long exposure now and then from a creative standpoint. So those are my filters. This little pouch you might have seen on my camera bag strapped onto the outside. 
so I can get at them or I can hang it off my tripod, really handy. Um, as you know, I'm all about things being quick and easy, no fuss, light as a feather. These filters are the cheapest of the cheap, by the way. They're a French manufacturer called Coquin or Coquin. Thank you, Mr. Dunnett. Um, they're resin filters, which is why they're cheap. Optically, they're a bit rubbish. They scratch easily. And if you get sea spray on them, they're a bugger to clean, but they're cheap. And I'll live with the problems because if I went to glass filters, which are absolutely brilliant. I mean, for example, if I, if I felt like running to it, I'd buy Nissi because they're great. Um, but they are a bit pricey for my budget and, and frankly for a lot of people. And if you're just getting into landscape photography, try a set of these before you then invest in some good quality glass ones. Let's be fair, I probably will in due course, but I'm still recovering from the culture shock of buying this system. So maybe for my birthday next year, Mrs. G. Um, anyway, that's filters. Brilliant. They, ma they make you able to be creative in the field. They make life easier. Um, and yeah, I use them a lot. So happy days. Right. I hope that uh, answers the question for you three gentlemen. Uh, the last question today is about frequency separation. Um, Philip Culbertson, who's asked me a few questions. Thank you ever so much, Philip. You're keeping the channel going. You realize that, don't you? Um, I'm interested in your comment about sharpening using frequency separation in Photoshop. I've only shot my images in Lightroom. It generally seems to work, but I'm intrigued now that I may be missing an opportunity. Can you briefly explain a bit more about the difference? Um, yes, I can. What I'm going to do is just very quickly compare and contrast sharpening in Lightroom and Photoshop, and then why I particularly like frequency separation. So I'm going to jump on the computer here and bear with me a moment while I fire up a screen recording. I've got the sun over my shoulders. So I'm really struggling to see the screen, so bear with me. Um, so much for my fancy outside broadcast, eh? Right, so what we'll do is we'll pop down into the detail section and Philip, I'm guessing this is where you do your sharpening. So you would crank up your sharpening like that. And as you know, if you hold down the Alt key and move the masking, you can then adjust what actually gets sharpened. That's OK. Nothing wrong with that at all. You'll notice in this particular example, I'm sharpening in particular the outline of the tree and also the horizon line. And the horizon line is getting heavily sharpened. Now, the problem I have with this is that I have no mechanism to control which bits of the image are having sharpening applied to them. I can't mask it. And that means that even though I can say certain areas of the image I don't want sharpened much. The problem I've got is that those distinct lines between light and dark, I can't stop it sharpening those. If I want to sharpen it quite a bit in certain areas and not in others, I'm stuffed. And I do like to be able to control what I do and don't sharpen. So that's the reason I use Photoshop and not Lightroom. I, I wouldn't just wouldn't even contemplate using Lightroom if it forces me to have to apply something to the entire image. So let's pop over to Photoshop where I've got the same image open. And there are a number of mechanisms by which to sharpen in Photoshop. There are the standard sharpening filters. So if we go up to filter up here uh, and then come down to sharpen, you will see there are five or six options. Another way is to use what's called a high pass filter. What you do with that is you create another layer. I'm not going to do it because I'm going to show you that my favorite version. Frequency separation is based on a technique that's wasp. <laughs> it's based on a technique that's used for um, portraits. And what it does is it takes the detail in somebody's face and separates out the tone and hue from the fine detail, the, the pores and the spots and whatever else you might want to cover up. So by splitting them out into two separate layers, hence separation and frequency separation, and the word frequency is used to denote low frequency being the tones and hues, high frequency being the detail. By separating those two out into separate layers, you can control how you can retouch a portrait. And it works quite well for sharpening because by controlling the opacity of one of the layers, you can dial in more or less sharpening as you wish. So let me show you how I would use that. And it's very easy. And bear in mind that I have it on uh, an action, so I don't do this every time. 
But what we're going to do is the first thing is very quickly Command J or Control J twice to create two layers. Layer one is a Gaussian blur layer. So we go filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and we want a five pixel blur. That's perfect on that layer. The layer above it, we're going to go to image, apply image. Don't ask me about the technicalities of this. You don't need to know, which is just as well because I don't know. Uh, right, blending mode is add. We want it as add. Opacity 100%. The target layer uh, is not the merged, it's layer one. In other words, the Gaussian blur layer. And we want it inverted. So we click OK on that. And as you may be able to see from the screen now, we've kind of created what you might recognize as a sharpening layer. So what we're going to do with this is change the blend mode to linear light. And now what we've done is we've created another layer which is exactly the same as the layer that we started with underneath these two. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to use Command G to group these two layers. What that means is that I can create a sharpening layer to do a bit of sharpening at one area of the image and another sharpening layer for another area of the image. So I've got group one here, which is one sharpening layer. Let me just duplicate that group for a moment and hide it. Go back to my group one. And if I go to layer one, which is my Gaussian blur layer, and I bring the opacity down from 100%, as I go lower on the opacity, the sharpening effect gets greater. So down at 30%, it is sharpening quite heavily across the image. Um, I tend to have my preset to run it to 60%. I find that to be a good starting point. If I just switch that sharpening on and off, you can see, particularly if you look at the branches of that little tree, it really pops out. The problem is that's because it's generated a halo around it. It's far too sharp. So what I would do with that is on my Gaussian blur layer, I bring my opacity up to at least 60% and probably higher in this case because there is a really hard transition between the uh, rock, the tree and the sky background. So that would be a reasonable bit of sharpening for an image like this. Now what I would also do, and this comes back to what I was saying about Lightroom, is I will add in a uh, layer mask on this one. And at the moment it's a white layer mask, which means that entire layer is visible. But one thing I would certainly do on that layer mask is if I click on the mask and then I bring up a brush, press B for brush and pull that right down so it's much smaller and make sure that I'm brushing in black. Yes, I am. I'll take that brush and I'll run it right along my horizon line because I don't need the horizon line sharpened. The reason I'm sharpening is for the detail below the horizon line. And in fact, I don't even need the sky sharpened, of course. So I could go all the way around this tree like this and all the way up the horizon line to the top. And if you have a look at the sharpening, uh, sorry, the mask layer now, if I uh, click on that and use Alt, you can see I've now got basically a trace of the line that Everything below that I want sharp and everything above that I don't need sharpen. Now, if I detail in the sky, I might just mask out the horizon as I've done here, but there's nothing to stop me then filling in above that line. So I could uh, pull my brush size right up and then just fill in above there. Not going to do it, you know, if I was doing it seriously, I'd take my time over it. But you get the idea. So what I've done now is I've created a zone below the horizon that's sharpened above, not sharpened, doesn't need to be. Now, let's say we've got an area down the bottom of this image, say somewhere down the bottom here, that we want sharpened even more. Then we can use our other layer and we can crank up the sharpening in that layer and only make that visible in the area that we want to sharpen down the bottom. I'm not gonna do it now, I'm sure you get the idea. So that's why I use frequency separation because I can dial in exactly how much I want I can create as many sharpening layers as I want and sharpen this bit up here more, this bit down here less, this bit up the top here not at all. Gives me that fine control that I want over my images. I think that's about it for this one.
Thank you ever so much for tuning in. No doubt I've rambled on much longer than I intended to in the first place, but thank you as always for your support. If you haven't done it yet, why not subscribe now and join me next time? Cheers.